What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Wednesday, March 20th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, big out of Sarah week. Big oil executives push back against calls for fast energy transition. We will then move to up to 58 gigawatts of coal faces retirement in PJM by 2030 without replacement capacity in sight, according to Market Monitor. Next up, Biden officials mull quicker death for U.S. coal power plants. And then finally, um, in the new segment, energy guru Daniel Jurgen quote, I'm sick of the energy transition. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas finance markets. I've got a couple things I want to talk about um, besides prices. Uh, the the API crude oil inventories uh, dropped yesterday. As you listen to this, you'll find out what the EIA inventories are. We will cover them on Thursday show, but give you a little sneak peek of what the EIA might do. ExxonMobil CEO Darren Woods comes out and quote says, ExxonMobil Mobile has no interest in Hess, or uh, despite Chevron purchase dispute, again, according to Darren Woods. So we'll dive into that. And then finally, uh, wrapping it up back where we started at Sarah Week, Total Energies to acquire upstream portfolio in the Eagleford Shale. So very interesting. Wow. By our friends over at Total Energies. So <laughs> we will cover all that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I'm Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's head off to our buddies there in Sarah Week. Big oil executives push back against calls for fast energy transition. You know, a transition is generally smooth. This is not going to be smooth. So this is about as smooth as some of those self-driving Ubers down in Phoenix. Oh yeah, retro. Uh, here's where uh, uh, Amen Nasser. We already talked about this. We yep. should abandon the fantasy of phasing out oil and gas. Instead, invest in them adequately to reflect yep. demand. How good is that? Let's let the markets decide. I, that was a great quote right there. Despite the growth of electric vehicles, uh, oil demand will reach a new record 104 million barrels per day this year. Peak oil still is not around the corner. <laughs> I love this quote. Meg O'Neill, she's the CEO of Woodside Energy. She was on a panel and said, quote, you're hearing some very pragmatic views up here. Um, and, you know. They basically was saying we we need to reject what are, quote, these simplistic views that the transition to cleaner fuels can happen at an unrealistic pace. So that's what's interesting about this. You know, this is supposed yep. to be the climate green, you know, event of the year, you know, sort of trying to center themselves as the summer cop 20, you know, another version of cop. People are going after the energy transition here. It's been good to see. We saw Petrobras CEO, ExxonMobil CEO, Shell right. CEO all come out at Sarah Week and basically reject this quick energy transition. It's been kind of crazy to see. Uh, yeah, and Jennifer Granholm, uh, I still think that if she ever dated Fetterham, it'd be Fetter Graham. Uh, one, uh, she says, uh, that's one opinion. She said of Nasser's prediction, continuing long-term for fossil. There's been other studies that suggest the opposite that oil and gas demand and fossil demand will peak by 2030. Uh, whatever she's smoking, I want to buy some because she is not clearly looking at the market data. Uh, here's where, well, I mean, she's, she, she's clearly clinging to the the IEA's interpretation that by 2030 we'll have reached peak oil demand. So, right. I mean, that's the beautiful part about if you're a politician, you've got the IEA to lean on and say, well, they're telling me it's their fault. Right. Um, and there's not a lot of incentives to drive low carbon hydrogen fuel projects. Hmm. And it, yeah. it, it it's unbelievable. OK, let's get rolling here. Uh, the next story here, up to 58 gigawatt faces retirement in PJM uh, by 2030 without replacement capacity in sight. This is nuts. 
So this goes hand in hand with this story, the, the next story that we're going to cover. The PJM power plant owner said they will retire 4.3 gigawatts with an estimated 19.6 gigawatts could retire for regulatory reasons before 2030, including 10.5 of coal, 33.8 may be uneconomic based on um, capacity. This is this is unbelievable. Do you know how many people are going to be without power? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, they don't have a clear line of sight to what's going to backfill it, which I think is goes back to the things we've been covering. The grid is not ready for all of these retirements. We need to be able to, you know make sure that these retirements i mean you know they they the, the market yeah. monitor report did put out that these retirement estimates are uncertain and that if these if coal can, remains high in terms of co- uh, price for what you know what a, what the pjm can get they're going to keep some of that capacity online so there's a little bit of both but that's Absolutely well, incredible. If that were the case, the levels of potential requirements would match that from 2011 all the way to 2023, which is absolutely which gives you an idea of the speed at which they're doing this. Th- that's exactly right. And and when we take a look at data centers and we take a look at AI, the electricity demand is going up exponentially. And when you take a look at the Biden administration, uh, that's the next article. Biden officials mull quicker death for U.S. coal power plants. They're already trying to put a stake in these things. Listen to this one. A spokesperson for the EPA declined to comment on the substance potential changes. Okay, we're just going to go ahead and say we're going to make changes, but we're not going to. But here's a quote. These final carbon pollution standards will protect public health, reduce harmful pollutants and deliver deliver billions of dollars in climate and public health benefits. The agency said in emailed statement, the EPA is working to issue this final rule later this spring. Here's the problem, Michael. People are going to die and and they're going to die because they don't have enough electricity. It's a security issue. Lights mean security. You're going to have refrigeration. You're going to have the grid go down. These rules were already rolled out. This quote unquote power plant rule already has been really quote unquote rolled out existing coal power power plants basically need to get rid of all of their greenhouse gas emissions by 2040 or close the difference of what this new potential rule could do is say no 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 not only do you have to close by even a date before 2040 it's not enough to reduce greenhouse and become net zero you just have to shutter so this This goes against the innovation and the technology that the energy industry is going to put into it. And this is the thing. If we can figure out a way, if we can actually obtain this net zero fantasy, why? Coal might as well be part of the solution if we can net it out over there and you can actually prove that it's netted. So this just goes to show you they are just trying to get rid of coal. Regardless of what they say about net zero, yes, net zero sounds nice. It's really what they want to do is shift to other forms of energy that they control. That they can control. You nailed it right there. They can go no electricity for you. Boom. And that's exactly what they want to do. Absolutely. All right. Let's go to Daniel uh, Jurgen, energy guru, Daniel Jurgen. Quote, I'm sick of the energy transition discuss- discussion. I like Daniel. I've had the fortune of talking to him a couple of times. And he is when he was interviewing with David Blackman, love me some David Blackman. Um, and he says, quote, I'm sick of the energy transition discussion. It sometimes loses touch with economic history and reality. If you look at the energy history of energy trans uh, transitions, they last for over a century. Try and make a change that happens in 25 years or even half of that time is highly unlikely. He's one cool cat yep. and he's down there uh, speaking at it. Um, if uh, he says a long time ago, people seemed a lot more uh, optimistic. Well, it's because we've become more electrified 
uh, and rely on the grid. Uh, yeah. No, it's, in here. I mean, there's not much to add to this article other than I would check it out, guys. You can hit the description below, but he, he brings up some great points. This transition, if we're even going to make the transition, it's going to be at least a century, let alone the 25 year quote unquote time frame. They got it here. You know, he points out that I love, you know, we, for all the hype of renewable energy, it's only increased by 6% worldwide year over year. That's not that much. No. And when you take a look at uh, what has happened at the cost of energy from 2008, we covered this last week, I believe, 2008 to 2023, um, the six, the, there, it's now 15% that we had an increase, but power in California has increased to almost 98%. That's nuts. Crazy. So off to you. Yeah, well, we'll go ahead and, and run it over to finance, guys. But before we do that, as always, um, we got to pay the bills here. Check us out, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy business. Um, hit the description below, as I just mentioned, for all of the links to the timestamps and all of the articles. Um, you can also check out dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. Go ahead and, and, and check out our data news combo. We really appreciate that. Um, you can email the show questions at energynewsbeat.com. I'm um, recording a podcast tomorrow with John Farrell over at Well nice. Database covering Cord and Enter Plus. And then we will be doing next week an overview of the EQT Equitrans deal. So check that out on the deal spotlight. We're going to really be pushing that hard as well. Again, guys, all of, we, all of this info is available www.energynewsbeat.com. I think, you know, uh, from an overall market standpoint, we saw the S&P 500 up about a half a percentage point. NASDAQ only about two, uh, two tenths of a percentage point. That was mainly because of, uh, of some a little Indivia press release gap that happened this morning. So NASDAQ trails a little bit, but Indivia already up $20 from its relative early morning trading. So not much, not much interesting going on there. We saw 10 year or two year and 10 year yields basically move absolutely nowhere. So um, 4.6 for the 10 year and 4.2 or excuse me, 4.6 for the two year and the 10 year it sits at 4.29. We saw Bitcoin down $3,000 again off record highs down to 63,911 so still still obviously um uh, fairly high up there crude oil really having its basically multi month high uh sitting there at 8273 for for crude oil um WTI Brent sitting at 8726 main reason for that is 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 these Ukrainian attacks on Russian refineries you know the forward looking thesis is that Russia is going to have to, because of this, be decreasing a lot of their outward oil flows, um, which is going to, again, help um, support higher oil prices. Um, you know, there's this, uh, what's his name in here? Hodge, a Stone X energy analyst, Alex Hodge. He's got some calculations out there that says the attacks on Russian refineries could decrease um, of around 350,000 barrels of global oil and petroleum supplies and boost U.S. crude prices from today's level by about $3 per barrel, which would put us somewhere in the $85 range, which is kind of at the upper end of where that bandwidth is. So um, could be interesting. That would also push Brent oil prices above 90, which is a, a key marker that a lot of these Middle Eastern countries are looking for. We've seen OPEC continue to cut, cut, cut. And, you know, they, they saw no signs at Sarah Week of saying they're going to they're going to pump more. So they're absolutely um, continuing to pump there. You know, real quick, as you guys listen to this on Wednesday, you'll be a privy to what's going on with the EIA crude oil storage inventories. The API yesterday went ahead and released their forward looking uh, guesstimate at what those strategic as what those commercial reserves might be. They predict a one point five million barrel draw the strategic mm. petroleum reserves and commercial reserves uh, relative to a basically a flat forecasted build. So uh, very interesting. They're also helping support oil prices. Um, you know, the other thing I found interesting, Stu, is 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 uh, we've got two basically Sarah Week stories to wrap up. Exxon Mobil, quote, 
has no interest in Hess amid Chevron lease dispute, according to their CEO. Um, to give you a quick headline, the boss over there at ExxonMobil, Darren Woods, said on Monday that he has no interest in buying Hess Corporation outright, despite Chevron Corporation's attempt to take it over. Um, they're currently sitting in arbitration over its proposed $52 billion merger with the company. I love this quote, Stu. If we were interested in doing something with Hess, we wouldn't have waited for Chevron. Nice. <laughs> but he did say that they aim to secure and confirm their preemptive rights to understand the value implied by the Chevron deal and make sure they do right by the ExxonMobil shareholders. And this is actually fairly brilliant. This is a little bit of shade at the ex at the, the Chevron folks. They basically said, yo, we could have bought in Hess anytime we wanted to, and we haven't. So good luck with Hess. What we deserve the right to do is understand what the value of Guyana of Hess's Guyana assets are because we technically have the first right of refusal. So, sure, you can take Hess, but we're going to take the more valuable stuff, which is Guyana, which, you know, what I find funny is there's got to be some – whoever negotiated this deal for Chevron, the lawyers, they bet, they're going to be looking for jobs, Stu. Oh, they I wouldn't it. hire them no. at all because they swung it, missed it, this one, and are probably going to put Chevron on the hook for a couple billion dollar breakup fee because oh, what, Chevron's going to be liable. So friends, Michael? We'll, we'll never know the land and legal team that put this deal together for Chevron, but they're going to be in the bread lines with the rest of us because uh, but, they, they it, swung and missed. Let me give you another one uh, Woods uh, said this week. Uh, he also said... Uh, Exxon CEO says hydrogen project at risk without IRA tax credits. They're really having a problem with multiple big oil companies around. This is in a different article on Bloomberg. And there's so many different art, uh, companies that are getting away from green, going green, you know, in hydrogen and everything else, because there's no um, uh, support from the financial side to do this. So I found it funny that in that same speech that he gave at Sarah week, <laughs> he, he was bagging his, his hydrogen. Yeah. I, the other headline I saw coming out of Sarah week was total energies acquiring upstream position wow. in Eagle Ford shell. This didn't have this on, as you like to say, didn't have this on my bingo card for 2024. <laughs> no, I, I would not have either, you know, after total, they bought, no, yeah, you they, would not total energies. Gets in the space and acquiring a non-operated, which is again interesting, wow. non-operated upstream acquisition um, in the Eagleford Shale. It's basically owned and it's owned by Lewis Energy Group and operated by EOG. Um, to give you an idea, um, this is in Webb County down there, um, and this is mainly to support the Rio Grande LNG terminal. So they're basically getting it as a non-operated partner, attempting to secure some marketing for their LNG assets, but also taking, again, that non-operated position and taking it off Lewis Energy Group's hands. So so very interesting. Remember, it's a 20-year deal that Total has with Next Decade um, to basically export about 5.4 million tons per year um, of LNG, which they'll luckily be able to sneak through because they've already started building it. But, um, they That but, investment decision or that FID final investment decision was made in 2023 to build out that first phase, um, which should have the total production capacity of about 17.6 uh, million megat or million tons per Per year so absolutely unbelievable but the tal energies they they go ahead and get in on the uh the non-op side very interesting i w again would not have guessed is they're not immune and they're not idiots when it comes to upstream but they haven't operated upstream in 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 the united states in a long time so it's gonna be very interested to see how well, this works out they did buy the uh all the uh natural gas power plants enough for two nuclear reactors in gigawatts being produced so that they own a lot of power plants. So they're buying the whole food chain in Texas. 1.21 gigawatts. <laughs> if I only had hair, I would use that line. <laughs> if only you did. You <laughs> old doc. Well, all right, what else, Stu? We're about to finish up. Oh, no, just more entertainment. Looking forward to some great things coming around the corner. Yeah, absolutely, and guys. Appreciate and everybody. Oh, go ahead. Check out our Doomberg and Chris Wright episode today. And then to, on Friday, we have um, Robert Bryce uh, going out. So yes. we got we some big it. boys.
We love Chris Wright. We love Doomberg. And we do love Robert Bryce. So check that out. All EMB Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, at www.energynewsbeat.com. But with that, guys, we'll go ahead and let you get out of here, get back to work. Appreciate you checking us out. Energy News Beat Podcast for Stuart Turley. I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.